Um, can we give it up for the worship team? That was awesome. Um, I don't know what you guys think, but I think we got some of the most gifted worship leaders around. Man, it's joy to worship with them. So I just said, my name's Joel. Um, my full name's Joel Ryder. You might also hear me called Joe, okay? So this is kind of a joke that's running around. I've learned to laugh along with it. Um, it started off kind of just as this thing. I was like, hey, don't call me that. That's not my name. Um, and then a good friend of mine, we were at his bachelor party. He's like, hey, we got to give nicknames to everybody. And mine was Joe. And because this guy is the nickname King, of course, it stuck. So everybody started calling me Joe. Then Ryan started calling me Joe. Then Mike started calling me Joe. And the whole staff started calling me Joe. Now I go by Joe. But my given name is Joel, so I won't be mad if you call me Joel. Um, long story short, um, I had the opportunity to be a part of Salt Company the last three and a half years. It's been an awesome blessing in my life. Um, people have poured out their heart for Jesus Christ, and it has brought fruit in my own life and fruit in countless others. And so I'm happy that you guys are here, and I'm happy that you get to be a part of this. And so if you're joining us for the first time this summer, we're going through the book of 1 John. Okay, this is a wonderful book. Um, it's a book that was started by a very good friend and brother Chandler last week. He gave a heck of a sermon, and he told us to be moth. Okay, And what he was saying with that was, hey, I want you to run toward the light with your entire life. Like you're entitled, everything you have to run to the light because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And so if a moth goes to a light and we run towards Jesus, our life will be what it is meant to be. But there's something else that I want us to point at in the first chapter of 1 John. And it's the word fellowship. So John actually tells us that his joy is made complete when he shares the gospel with other people, the good news of Jesus Christ, because when he shares the good news, they get to join in fellowship with him. And not just fellowship with him, but fellowship with the Son of God, that is Jesus Christ, and with God the Father himself. Like, that's incredible. Like, we get to have a relationship with the God of the universe. And this word fellowship is one I need you to hold on to tonight, because it's going to be the emphasis of where John is going. So if you're learning how to read your Bible for the first time, or you're just wanting to get better at it, a good tool to use is you always want to know what was said before you were reading. Okay, so that didn't really make any sense. I'm thinking about it out, coming out of my mouth now. What I'm saying is a whole book is written as a book like in the whole. Like the whole message of 1 John will stay constant. Like the whole message of the Bible is constant. And so I'm saying is we need to look at back what Chandler said in order to move forward into what John's going to tell us tonight. Okay, so if you guys want to open up, obviously, to 1 John, we're going to be starting in chapter 2, verses 3. Okay, we're going to take little breaks. We're going to go 3 through 11, but we're going to take some stopping points in there. So we'll start it off. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commands, the one who says I have come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. All right, you can stop there. Our big idea of tonight and actually the big idea of our entire lives is that we would know Jesus Christ. Okay, if you're a Christian, you've known that for a while. If you're coming and you're not a Christian, the role of our lives, the reason we were made is to know Jesus Christ and to love him. And so we look at that fellowship and we realize what John was saying with this fellowship was that you guys are sinners. So if you come into this room, whether you know it or not, you have sinned today. Like in some way or another, you have wronged yourself before God. And John has made it clear to us that we need help right? Sin is the great plague of humanity, and it's a plague that is in every single one of us. What John has told us is that the fellowship with Jesus Christ is actually the great news for every single one of our lives, and that is, though we were sinners, he died for us. And he died for us that we might have salvation and live with him in eternal life. And so we need to know Jesus in order to be saved, Like, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you will not be saved. You will not have eternal life. Like, he is the one avenue, the one door, the one way to life itself. And so John puts this emphasis on knowing him. Like, we have to know him. But we live in a culture, an Americanized culture, right? We also are very European-based. They influence a lot. Um, And what I'm saying by that is, um, basically speaking, we love knowledge. Okay. We love to know things. The enlightenment was this huge thing that changed the way the world lived forever. And people began to think that they knew things just because they knew a lot about them. 
And the truth happens with us. Sometimes we think we know things just because we know a lot about them. And the reality is, is you might say you know who I am because you know my name and you know what I'm doing right now. And I might say I know who you are because I know your name. But the reality is none of you really know me that well and I don't probably don't know you that well. And so we made up this term of, oh, I know them, but you don't actually know them. And to put that on a bigger scale for where we're going tonight, I want you to think about your favorite celebrity, right? I just had this awesome chance to be trained with my team and they taught me that I need to be a believer Okay, I need to believe in Justin Bieber, okay, in the, in the movement that he has with his singing. That's not the celebrity I'm going for tonight, but you can, you can have that one in your mind if you want. I don't know anything about him, so I can't use that. I'm going to talk to you guys about Michael Jordan, okay? I'm a, I'm a big, okay, that's not true. I'm not a big basketball fan. I enjoy watching him specifically play. I grew up in a family where we had all the DVDs, right, back in the DVD age when things were still on disc. And I would watch his game sevens. Okay, just kidding, he didn't have game sevens as a little shout out, sorry. Um, <laughs> I would watch all his NBA finals games, okay, right? I watched this guy be a majestic basketball player, a guy who changed the face of the game. And I've gotten in many arguments with another good friend of mine of whether or not he is better than LeBron James. Okay, many of you may have had this argument. If not, it don't matter. That's not where we're going tonight. But what happened in me preparing for this argument is I got to know a ton of facts about Michael Jordan. All right, I knew where he grew up. I know his family members. I know the high school he went to. I know that high school basketball didn't go great for him. That was his turning point. I know he won championships in North Carolina. He won championships with the Chicago Bulls. He's a Hall of Famer. He's now an NBA owner. Like I know all of these facts. And I had used them countless times to defend why he was supposedly the best player of all time. We're not going to get into that, like I said. But the point of that is you might ask me, do you know Michael Jordan? And I'd probably look at you and be like, yeah. But the reality is I don't know Michael Jordan. If I went to Michael Jordan's house right now, I jump his nice gate with the 23 on it. I run up to his door and I knock on the door. And for some odd reason, even though he's worth like more than a billion dollars, he opens his own door and he says, hey, what's going on? I'm like, yo, what's up, Mike? I know everything there's to know about you. Like, let's be buddies. And he's like, like, no, boom, door in my face, you know? But it gets worse than that because he probably has security guards. So within a minute, I'm probably decked by a security guard. And within 10 minutes after that, I'm probably arrested for trespassing. I'm going to go to jail, okay? Long story short, I don't know Michael Jordan and I'm not going to try that. But I'm saying that many of us have been taught that we know Jesus Christ, but we don't actually know him. Okay, like if you were like me, you grew up in a church where you learned a lot of things. I went to a Christian grade school. And I was taught a lot of things. We memorized verses every single week. I knew the geography. I knew the books. I could sing them, you know, like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Like if you know that, you know, okay? If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, But basically, I knew a ton about Jesus, but it didn't affect me. And the reality is, is if we know Jesus, what John's going to show us tonight is that it should affect us. And so he says this, this is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands. All right, and so some of you might, your first knee-jerk reaction to that is, wait, commands, are you serious? I thought this wasn't a works-based faith. I thought we were saved by grace. Like, what's up with this whole listening thing? Like, why do I have to listen to somebody else? All right, it's, we're pretty rebellious age. Our age loves to just not listen to everybody older than us for some reason. But in that, we don't want to listen to commands. Right, and the truth is, I'm going to tell you the truth. Like, we aren't in a works-based faith. Like, that is true. Like, I don't care if you go to church every single day, not every single day, every single Sunday of your life, you go to Salt Company every Thursday of your college career, if you memorize a million verses, if you evangelize a million people, those things in themselves cannot save you. And they won't save you. And if you show up to Jesus someday and you're like, hey, like, look at all these things I did for you, he tells us in Matthew 7 that he doesn't know those people. Because the role of our lives isn't to do incredible things, it's to know Jesus. And so when we see this and it says, hey, if you know Jesus, keep his commands, he's not saying, hey, like, go do the right thing in order to know Jesus. He's saying, like, those who actually know Jesus will do the right things, right? Those are completely different. And you still might be like, hey, man, I don't like this commands thing. But John goes on to tell us, starting in verse 5, but whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. Point one is obeying Jesus' commands will make our love for God complete. I took it right out of the text. 
Because it's a point made by John, it's a point we all need to hear tonight, that if we obey Jesus Christ, our love of God is made complete. If you have the ESV version, it says perfect. I love that. Like our love of God is made perfect. Like perfectly complete. The story of Jesus is a lot more than just somebody dying on the cross for us. Like the story of Jesus is that Jesus was in heaven as the son of God with a perfect relationship with the father. And he looked on the world that had been created, that had been created through him and for him, and it was broken. And it was disastrous. And so the father's like, I love these guys. I want to save them. And the son's like, I do too. And I'm going to obey you to, the, to my death. Like I'm going to lay down my life in order to save these people. And so Jesus is whipped. I'm not talking like you smack, like these things had like, like little teeth on them and like little metal pieces. They like ripped the flesh off of Jesus' back. And Jesus was beaten and Jesus was spit on and they drove a crown of thorns into his forehead just to mock him for claiming to be our king. And the nails were driven through his hands and his feet. He was hung on a cross where he would suffocate. And just in case he didn't suffocate, they decided to drive a spear into his side to make sure he was dead. And he went, he went to the tomb. And we know that part of the story. He's buried behind this massive stone. Like that's game over for everybody except for Jesus, right? And Jesus would come back to life and him coming back to life is why he came because he beat death in order that me and you could beat death. Like essentially we earned it. Like Romans tells us the wages of sin is death. Like what me and you have earned, what we have earned today is to die. But what Jesus did was die for us that we might have life. What John is saying in verse five is, but whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. The death of Jesus Christ is the greatest act of love the world has ever seen and the world will ever see. And to be loved so much can only cause us to love in return. And John's saying, hey, like you see how you've been loved. If you know this Jesus who really gave up absolutely everything for you, Like he gave up glory in heaven in order that he might be your savior. When you love this God the way he loves you, your only response can be to obey him because that's how we love him back. That's a beautiful picture, guys. Like our love is made perfect for a God who perfectly loved us. Our love is made complete for a God who completely loved us when we obey his commands. But it doesn't stop there. Verse six, John tells us, the one who says he remains in him, him being Jesus, should walk just as he walked. Jesus didn't just come and die in order that we may live a life and say, I want to obey Jesus. He didn't come and leave and just kind of be like, I'll be back someday. He actually makes a promise to us. He's like, if you know me and you keep my commands, your love will be perfected. And if your love is perfected, what John is telling us tonight is that we will walk as he walked. And Jesus has promised us that if you confess his name, if you love Jesus Christ truly, he pours his spirit upon you and in you. The words walk, I think, are an incredible word. We're so fast today. We're so, I gotta get going. I gotta move fast. I gotta run here. Just get me to the next year. But John uses the word walk. Why? Because every day you have to take a step at a time, one foot in front of the other. What he's telling us tonight is that Jesus didn't just do this in order that we would be left alone until the end. He said, no, I want to walk with you. I want to be with you. That means if you're watching a movie and you're like, man, I love this movie. Jesus is probably loving the movie right next to you. If you're like, hey, I want to hang out with my friends and I want to laugh. Jesus is laughing with you. Why? Because Jesus is awesome. It's crazy. Isn't that awesome? He's a fun guy. But the reality is too, like, we all know life isn't that easy. It isn't movies. It isn't always laughing and jokes. Like some of us have experienced death of loved ones. We might be in a terrible place right now. Our world might be falling apart. We might feel like we are more broken than we ever thought possible. And the only thing left for us to do is to cry. I've been there. I'm sure most of you have too. And if not, I'm telling you, it's terrible and it will come. There will come a day in your life where you can do nothing but cry because you have no idea what else to do. But just as much as Jesus is there when you love your favorite movie, 
Jesus is crying his eyes out when you're crying your eyes out. Jesus loves you just as much in that moment as he does in the most fun moments of our life. The walking as we walked means Jesus will be there for everything. And he wants to be there for everything. I was trying really hard to like compare this to something, right? We're always told like have an analogy, have some way to explain this. And I'm like, okay, there's gotta be a relationship in our life that's somewhat close to this that I can kind of make sense of. And the reality is there isn't. Like I couldn't find one. Like a relationship like this doesn't exist among human beings. Like going back to my Michael Jordan kind of reference, like Michael Jordan wants nothing to do with me. I mean it. The dude is elite. In the eyes of the secular world, the man is about as great as it gets. For what he did, he got to be as great as it gets. Like there might've been a chance at some point, like if I had gone to high school with him, maybe he would have been like, yo, what's up, bro? I'm on the varsity basketball team. And I'd be like, hey, and he wouldn't have cared because I didn't play basketball. But he goes to college and I might've been in a class, but he started winning national championships. So he doesn't give a rip about me. And then he goes to the NBA and he starts winning championships and MVPs and all these accolades. And he's in the hall of fame. Then he's selling billion dollars of worth of shoes. He's the face of basketball for almost his entire life. Michael Jordan does not give a rip about me. And he doesn't give a rip about you. Whoever your favorite celebrity is, they do not care about who you are. <laughs> they don't. And it's just the truth. And why would they? We live in a world where the elite stay elite. Like, why would they care about average Joes? Like, why would they care about us if we couldn't move them forward? right? You think of when you want to get a job or you want to move up the chain, you have to prepare a resume, right? Some of you might not be there yet. Someday you're gonna have to prepare a resume, okay? Some of you might have done that. You might be working hard, which is good. Um, And basically you put the best version of yourself on a piece of paper in order that someone more important than you will hire you, all right? So let's say I want to meet Michael Jordan. I'm like, hey, bro, like, I don't care if we're friends. Can I just be an acquaintance? Like, can I be somewhere in there? I build this massive resume of how great I am. He probably wouldn't even look at it. I could probably get to a secretary, get shredded, whatever. Nobody cares. But Jesus Christ isn't like Michael Jordan. Jesus Christ isn't like every single celebrity you've loved your entire life that you've wanted to be friends with or your celebrity crush. You're like, maybe someday it's not happening. Um, (laughs) It's not happening. And the reality is, is Jesus loves us. And when we prepare a resume for Jesus, it's really funny because you might put your best things together <laughs> and you show up and like, hey, Jesus, just take a look. Like, give me a shot. Jesus is God. <laughs> you know what that means? It means like no matter how tr- hard you try to portray yourself as a perfect person, he sees the absolutely worst things about you. All right, you might be like terrified that. That is so comforting. <laughs> Because when I was at my worst, like if I look back in my life and I see the parts where I was the most broken, where I loved the world, Colossians tells us that all of us were born hostile to God. That means we're enemies. Like we, we are born to hate God and yet God loves us. Like in our worst, very worst state, like the person you hate about yourself, like those deepest, darkest secrets where you do never want to be seen and you never want to share with anybody, Jesus can see that. And yet, first, that's terrifying. (laughs) But Romans will tell us that Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. That means while you were in your absolute worst state, when you are at your absolute worst state, when you are the worst version of yourself, Jesus died for you then. And he wants to walk with you and talk with you and live with you. When he ascended after he rose from the grave, we're told that he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Like literally the best place to sit ever. And he is anointed king. Like he is king over everything. God gives him jurisdiction over everything. That means our favorite celebrities are not even close to comparable to how great Jesus is. And we can't do anything for Jesus' status. He's like greater than even the word status can like portray. But yet he looks at us and he loves us. And he says, I want to live day-to-day life with you. And John goes on. He says, dear friends, 
I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old command that you've had from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard. Yeah, I'm writing to you a new command, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. All right, this is kind of confusing. I'm still not sure why he wrote it exactly like that. Like, I'm going to give you a new command, but it's an old command, so it's not really new, but it is new. Essentially, what John is saying, it's the command of love. Okay, so if you know your Bible as well, or if you've come to know Jesus well, you know that Jesus summed up what it takes to stand before God, right? To be holy, that's the word we use. You have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. And you have to love your neighbor as yourself. Right, and John just walked us through the reality that we have to know and love God. That we actually have to love each other. And the reason it's an old command is because this is the story of the Bible, right? I told you this early. The themes of the books stay the same throughout. Like it doesn't change just because we want it to. That's not how the Bible works. It remains true and steady. God is true and steady. And so the reason it's old is because it was always the command. Jesus has already commanded this. And John is reminding us, but the reason it's new is because if you've ever tasted the love of Jesus, like if you've tasted that and you've been able to give that to someone else, it is richer every single time you do it. It's like, I want to put this in perspective. This is kind of a fun fact about me. I eat way too much beef. Sand. There was a three month period spring semester where I had two to three hamburgers for a meal for lunch and dinner and didn't really eat breakfast. So my diet consisted of beef and mustard for all you mustard lovers out there. Um, And starting in month one, you're like, man, burgers are great. You start getting better at cooking them. They get a little better. You season them a little better. You're like, man, this is nice. And then you start moving forward and you get to like month three. You're like, I am so sick of burgers, man. Like, this is terrible. You're like, I still got to eat my beef, so I start making tacos. But long story short, (laughs) the burgers got old fast. But the love of Jesus Christ doesn't. (laughs) I'm serious. Imagine the sweetest thing you've ever tasted in your life. Like, the absolute most delicious food. It, like, rocks your world good, Okay. Like Jesus' love is rock your world good. And when you share it to others, it is just as good every single time for the rest of your life. Let's move on. The one who says he's the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The command is to love one another. Like not just to love God, but to love one another. And that love is so rich that when we experience it with God, we want nothing else but to give it to each other. So John paints the hard line for us. You're either in darkness or you're in light. It's based on how you love your brothers and sisters. Like this is another test for us to know whether or not we know Jesus Christ as Lord. Do you love your brothers and your sisters? Right, he even makes it a little bit simpler than neighbor as yourself. He's like, hey, you need to love the people right next to you. You need to love the fellow people in the body of Christ, your fellow members in church. And the consequence is awful. <laughs> Like if you do not love one another, like you hate each other, you're in the darkness. But not just in the darkness, this time you're walking in the darkness and you don't know where you're going. Like you're lost. Like there's no getting back on track from here. Like if you do not have love, the path to life is gone. And he furthers it with saying, the darkness has blinded his eyes. The way I saw this put was, I want you to think about the eye as a spiritual organ. Okay, we know it is an actual organ, but a spiritual organ that allows us to see clearly what life is supposed to be. And what he's saying right here is that it's not like, hey, I got poked in the eye, I'm gonna wear an eye patch for three months, I'm gonna be fine. It's like your eye is utterly destroyed. 
Like to hate your brothers and sisters, to hate people, your life is utterly destroyed. Like there's no coming back. Like if we consistently step into hate, there is no coming back. But to stay in the light and the love and the richness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is to love one another. To love one another with the love he has shown us. If you jump back to the end of verse 8, we're told that the true light is already shining. And that's awesome. The world is full of darkness and hard things and hatred and sin, but yet the true light is already shining. Because Jesus has already come and he's flipping lives upside down from death into life. He's taking hatred and he's turning it to love and it's already happening, continuing to happen all around us. Like we have been given the opportunity to just play a part in the beautiful story of Jesus Christ, the beautiful story of our God. And so as we we come together at the end here, I just kind of want to sum it up for you guys true fellowship with Jesus Christ, like actually knowing Jesus will be followed by obedience. It is in this obedience that our love of God is perfected and we don't just have a view of life, but we have full life itself. We find true life and union with Christ and in this life we learn to love each other and that love from each other will extend to the ends of the earth as we learn to love non-believers as well. If you're coming in here tonight and you're like, man, I did not know the right Jesus. Like the Jesus I know didn't change my life. I still love my sin. I haven't changed at all. I'm telling you right now, like you don't know Jesus. Like if you think you know God, like you think you know Jesus and yet you don't know how to love your brothers and sisters, you don't know Jesus. But the reality, the comfort of the gospel tonight is that regardless of where you are, Jesus is welcoming you home saying, I will love you, come and love me that you may taste in the richness of his joy. And if you are a Christian, man, isn't that even the better news right now? Like we get to know our king. Like in all his greatness, we get to know him and know him fully. He has offered us friendship, fellowship, brotherhood, sisterhood for the end of our days and life everlasting. And so my encouragement to any of you is if you're like sitting in your life and you're like, hey man, like I got goals. Like we all do. But like, you're like, I have these goals. You're like, man, I, for example, I'm not trying to call anybody out specifically here, but you're like, I want to be a doctor. Okay, I was at that point once in my life. I gave all my time to studying. Okay, it's a very anxious life. It's very hard, but I gave all my time to studying. It's like maybe some of you have been there or it's a different major for you and you push away your Bible reading time and your time in prayer with Jesus. You're like, Jesus, I know you have called me to this job, so I'm going to do that. I'm not going to worry about spending time with you right now. I'll do that when I get there. Or maybe you're on the flip side and like, this is one that really plagues a lot of people. Like, I think you have called me to marry XYZ person. You have called me to marry said and said person. And so Jesus, I got to spend time with them. And so I don't have time for you because I know you have called me to this. And the dangerous one, the terrifying one actually, is many of us can get caught up in the reality that we want to live so hard for Jesus that we forget to give him any of our time. You're like, man, I got to disciple five guys this week. I got to disciple four or five girls this week. I got to step into this and advance this ministry and advance Jesus' name. All I can do is serve and serve and serve. And you spend all your time serving that you never actually invite Jesus into your life. Like the role of our lives, guys, it's not what we do or where we end up. The role of our lives, the goal of our lives is to know Jesus Christ, know him fully and love him entirely. And from there, the rest of it will be figured out. You'll disciple people better than you ever thought you could. Your life will go exactly where it's supposed to go for the glory of the kingdom. And the right people in the right time will come in and out of your life. The goal of our lives is to know Jesus So accept him tonight and take steps into that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, man, there's such a reality that I think it's so easy for us to get caught in our consistencies. We get caught in the reality that we think we're doing the right thing. And a lot of times we're doing good things. But when we do good things without you, Jesus Christ, they're not good at all. 
They miss the joy and the fruit and the love that they are meant to have. So my prayer for everybody in this room tonight is that they would know you, Jesus, and they would know you truly, that they would love you to the end of their days and have you first and foremost in every single day of their life. I thank you for the opportunity to love you, that you would reveal yourself to us in such an awesome way. Lord, bless these people. In Jesus' name, amen.